Today, we're continuing our series on the hyperscale sector of the data center industry. In today's discussion, we're talking about the massive impact the hyperscale user has caused over recent years. Stick around, we'll unpack the details next. There's a lot of money in the data center industry right now, which is exciting. Uh, but I think that's why it highlights the importance of the operational excellence that you just mentioned. You're listening to the Data Center Hawk podcast, where we demystify the data center market. Data Center Hawk is your online platform for data and commentary on the data center market. Stay tuned and be sure to join the thousands of others who rely on Data Center Hawk to make decisions in the data center space. Okay, so in the first couple episodes of this series, Dave, we talked about kind of who these hyperscale users are, where they are, how they've grown over the years, what caused the, the arisal of this uh, specific group of users. So today we're gonna talk about hey, how they impact the industry. And I think, this is what I think about it. Like if you, if you ran a lemonade stand, right? And you're like eight, 10 years old, moderately successful, right? You 20 bucks that, your money. This is and describing put in, my childhood right yeah, now. Yeah, and you got people to come by, buy some lemonade, buy some lemonade. And then one day some dude drives up and he goes, I'll have 10,000 cups of lemonade. That would radically change how you approach the lemonade sales. That's almost like what the hyperscale industry is. Now, maybe not to that same magnitude, but have done to the industry. I think it would be, you know, you would change your supply chain. You would change your marketing and sales. You would change your capital structure. I mean, all those things would happen. I mean, I know you were talking about capital structure at age 9, totally. 10. I've seen your business. 100% of my vernacular yes, then. your pro forma of your lemonade stand. So. <laughs> That's right. so let's talk a little bit about, you know, some of those ways that these large, large, extremely large buyers have impacted the industry. Um, so I'll just you know kick it to you. Say like you know you think like couple, top three ways that they've impacted the industry. What could, first comes to mind? Yeah, I think one is the the size of these requirements, and how serving those sized requirements is like you know massively changed everything. I actually went back through our numbers. Uh, you know, as we've tracked the market over the last you know six seven years, the data center market growth, and I think that's a really good illustration of how it's changed. So I was just going to give you the 2017, we, Desner, we, we basically are tracking the top 10 um, primary markets. That's what we started with. And then over time, we've added to that. So I just looked at the top 10 over the last four or five years. And so 2017, um, and this is the demand that took place. It was 233 megawatts. And I would even say like before this, like 2013, 14, 15, 16, those markets, you know, probably in like the 125, 150, 175. So 2017, 233, 2018, 402. 2019, also known as the digestion year, 280. 2020, 690. 2021, we're in the- 2020 two, was 690 megawatts. 690 megawatts. So, you know, that's one of the, it's just the scale of this has just impacted so, and it's created so many opportunities for people in the market. You know, not just data center operators that are helping these companies grow, but vendors that are in the space. You know, if you think about like cabling or, uh, you know, electrical companies or companies that are serving the the critical systems that need maintenance on a 30 day, 90 day, you know, yearly basis, like all that stuff's created big opportunities. So that's that's one way it's impacted the market. And I think the other thing is just, you know, it would be the impact on capital and not just how much you need, but how to deploy it and where to deploy it. And that's what this, you know, uh, use the term game, it's not a game, but it's really been this, how do we take this money? Where do we put it? Where do we build it? How do we invest it? And how does that serve our business best? And that's, um, that has been the story of our industry in the last five years. All right, so look, th thinking about like the size component of these deals, I mean, you may have not put down like the specific deal size, but even anecdotally over the last five years, like how have these deal sizes changed you know, how has the length of the deal changed, if at all, and then the pricing, et cetera, like, yep. how has that shifted in the last, you know, five to seven years, just based on, you know, around these, you know, kind of core users? Yes, I will take you back, Mike, to 10 years ago. Uh, you know, and we were seeing- that's Story time, I That's right, it. that's story time with David. So we were seeing the, the, the bigger hyperscale companies traditionally, like building, owning and operating their data center facilities in rural markets across the U.S. And that's where their big demand would go. It would go to places like Iowa, Boardman, Oregon, 
um, you know, just areas where they could get tax incentives and there was infrastructure there, a lot of power, a lot of water, et cetera. That, that s- changed significantly in the 2015, 16, 17 time period. And those companies wanted to be closer to population centers um, and their requirements got bigger. So those, that bigger demand that was out there, um, it, it changed. And so they continued that, but then they also added additional capacity in big markets. So uh, from a leasing size side, side of things, you know, in the 2013 to 2017 time period, like the large transaction sizes that, that we were seeing were in like the 10, you know, megawatt range. And that was considered obviously a very big transaction. You know, now over time that has shifted to really serve the strategic needs of either the smaller hyperscale companies that do have like four to eight, 12 megawatt requirements of growth or companies that have, you know, 36 megawatts of growth that they need to deploy in, you know, 18 megawatt phases or 72 megawatt requirements that companies are, are, uh, bill or, you know, are leasing from other providers. And so that's, that's where we've seen the change happen. And there's more companies that are doing that. You know, if you're listening to this and you don't know much about the space, this isn't like the, the market is not overwhelmed by these deals, meaning, you know, there's not, 20 72 megawatt requirements that are out there but um, there are certainly companies that have bigger requirements today than they ever have before and they are looking to the data center operator to help them figure that out yeah and when you talk about like on the capital side i mean as as we know we've talked about on this podcast a lot like there's a there's certainly an ideal that all operators would would strive for where probably something like they've got land yep that's prepped and you probably, you know, I think ideally before they even started construction, they'd have some type of commitment yep. uh, in hand. You know, short of that, how are companies, you know, trying to attain that ideal? And when they can't, what do the kind of the contingencies look like in order to make sure that they're available to serve these hyperscale users? Yeah, I mean, I think the <clears throat> specifically related to like the capital side of things, just having access to a lot of money because these deals are so big you know that's one of the ways that those companies have really positioned themselves to be able to serve those deals is that you've got to go out and get capital commitments before some of these bigger companies come to you and say hey we we need this in this market is this something that you can help us with um and i think those you know the hyperscale user uh, the data center user has gotten a lot smarter and is a lot uh, more savvy today than they were five or ten years ago. So, like you mentioned, the 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 site or site acquisition, like you know, we have discovered that a lot of these companies won't even talk to the the, the data center operator if they don't have land already acquired, because they don't want to waste the time or spend the time going down the road of can this site or provider fit our needs in this market when there might be site acquisition complications that could you know, delay their timeline. So I think that's, that's part of it. I mean, and then as I just think of the like greater whole, you know, the, the, the capital conversation around, you know, design around supply chain, speed to market scale, all of those things doing what the, the data center operator or industry is doing around that, you know, takes a lot of money. And, um, and I think that's the way that I've really seen, you know, my experience, um, the market be impacted by these big, big deals. You mentioned the land acquisition piece. And I think one of the things I've come to realize is that the immaturity of this industry is, it makes it more exciting. And where, what I mean is that, you know, we have companies that are buying large amounts of land and in anticipation of, you know, hundreds of megawatts of demand. And if you're listening to this podcast and it's now 2025 or 2026, you'll be able to see if this, you know, really impacted the industry or, or swung the industry either geographically or how the development takes place, you know, by then. But that's why that's what I like is I think people still think they can like shake up the industry. Yeah. You know, with how they approach it, specifically yeah. around these hyperscale guys. And so, you know, that, I don't think that's the case in other industries. Yeah. But I think you're going to continue to see people look for ways to kind of let's shift the conversation, but yeah. get more attention. Yeah. And it speaks to the the young nature of this market you know the this is not an industry that's been around the way it is today you know for 50 years i mean we i mean we're in such a 
young space that's changing so much so fast uh, that and, and it's and it's a space that is like critical to our everyday life and I think with those things you know that's the kind of stuff that makes it exciting you're still seeing like rapid innovation ideas um, and that, that could have a dramatic impact on how the market moves forward in the future yeah I think another way that manifests itself is like on the pricing side yep you know I think we work really hard to you know, understand where those kind of pricing ranges are. Right. And, you know, we've gotten feedback from a couple of folks who use that. You say like, hey, the, there's just nothing else out there. Yep. Um, and that's, you know, again, once again, speaks to the kind of the youngness of the industry. But, yeah. you know, there's a lot of, I wouldn't call it guesswork, but you, you talked about it being a game. And yeah. you know, some of that, you know, I think part of that is because you can, you can have a 50 megawatt need in the data center industry, which is whatever that is. 200,000 square feet, all right? Anyways, the math may not be great. Maybe higher, 300,000 square feet. Uh, office demand doesn't jump around like that. Right. And so that, I think that that makes it what you kind of alluded to about the gameness of it is that the, the demand can happen very quickly. Yes. That's probably what they're, yeah. I make my point eventually. No. I take the circuitous route sometimes, but I'll get there. The plane has been landed. I think the, <laughs> the, the reality around pricing too is you really have to understand what the what's actually being priced and what i mean by that is that you know in our market we have seen a dramatic decrease in pricing across the board across continents i mean this is just an industry um it's across the whole industry so just and, and there's reasons why you know one is that there's more competitors in the space uh, you know two is that it's a much more efficient product today than it was 10 years ago so you're you're actually providing less that's that's more efficient um and then three the margins have changed and the expectations have changed on the space because it's become much more competitive so um but yeah it's i mean we work hard on our pricing to make sure that we are putting out there numbers that help the industry to be as accurate as it as it can and also uh understanding what is actually being uh price which is changing you know and it, and it actually goes into like design changes and expectations of the user and how they look at what they want to buy uh and 10 years ago i think most data center operators out there say like this is just what we build you need to adapt to this mm -hmm. it's a totally different message today now it is how do you build and how can we adapt to that and that's why you see those numbers that i mentioned before you know 402 megawatts of absorption 2018, 2019, close to 300, 20, 26, 90. That is why those numbers have done what they've done. It's because that attitude or that tone has changed. Yeah, I think we, one of the stats that jumped out at me, I believe it was from a DCD Corning presentation, was like the hyperscale, they look at the top 20 and said like, what's the percentage of build their own versus lease? The number was like steadily the amount that they leased was steadily ticking up as a percentage of overall sure. growth, you know, from 16 to 20. And I think that's that's probably more of a function of high demand. They just literally cannot build fast enough. Yeah. And so these companies, again, the multi-tenant guys that we're, you know, tracking as well, need to they be able to pick up some of that demand. And like you said, it's it's powered shell, it's turnkey, it's what have you. So you know, talk a little bit about that, like the the dynamics of like a powered shell versus turnkey and why would companies go one way or the other? Yeah, and uh, you know, a lot has to do with, I mean, certainly has to do with capital, has to do with control, um, has to do with operating expenses. These are, you know, traditional real estate topics that, you know, how efficiently you run a building. And, and if a company is a single tenant occupier of a building, let alone a data center facility, it's most likely that they're going to want to have an operational team that runs it themselves. There might be scenarios where they prefer otherwise, but um, so when you think about a turnkey data center or a, a you know, fully built out data center, you know, that, that has a pricing structure that is paying for the, basically the reservation of the equipment of all the UPS and generators and raised floor and all that stuff. And so that's how that leasing structure is put together. There are some out there, some big data center users that actually prefer a different leasing structure. They prefer to lease the actual like building, but then they they take their capital and they go out and they bring the UPS and the generators and the race and all that stuff into the space and they pay for that. And so, uh, like I said, that's a, the advantage to them is that there's a control, um, 
advantage. There is a, an operating advantage for probably from their perspective. Uh, and I think there is potentially like a security advantage, you know, like their design is not necessarily shared with others. And um, so, and that's become more popular. You know, if you look in markets like, you know, Northern Virginia is where it's most popular. There's been a couple of, of users that have really taken that to the next level in that market. But, but it's also been uh, designed and built in other markets. And there's actually been data center operators that will go buy that because it's a timing issue, right? They go like, hey, we, we need to be in this market. We're not there yet. Um, if we buy this building or lease this infrastructure, we are, or lease this building, then we can actually get to the market faster. And so they buy it from a timing aspect. So there's a number of like, there's, there's a number of advantages around the, the powered shell concept. You know, I would have told you five, 10 years ago, it was going away. So the market was not building that. And now it's kind of coming back. Uh, a lot of that too is coming back because those bigger users, that is an option that they want to see probably on the table when they're looking where they want to grow. And so the data center operator community has had to had to really figure that out and go, Hey, do we want to provide this type of structure to the market? There are some that don't and they won't because of financial reasons. And there's some that do. And so that's just a, that's where we are today. in you know, 2021, you, you brought up, yeah, like the, some will, some won't, but I think that underscores one of the other impacts is just how these companies organize themselves. You know, most of these, most of the large, you know, co-location providers have entire teams, dedicated to solving all of those things you just described, yep. how to deploy the capital, where to deploy it, how quickly, when, you know, who can we pursue as a potential customer yep. for this space? Uh, is there a, can, is there a uh, scenario under which where, you know, they would say, okay, we've got, you know, option to build a building here, there, elsewhere, where they would almost prefer to have, um, you know, five tenants versus one in a given, in a given space. And why would they make that decision? Yeah, it could be the, um, you know, you, you might do that just given like if there's challenges with scale or something like that, you might say, hey, this is going to be a smaller campus for us or building for us. Um, you know, there's certain markets that it's hard. There are certain geographic markets that it's harder to actually deliver capacity to because of regulatory issues or um, design challenges like th those type of things. So there are some areas where you're you might be limited from that perspective. But if you have like a big um, if you know, most data center operators today or data center developments are done with a campus mentality. So you do have the ability to deliver different buildings or, or like build to suit, um, options in on certain like parcels of land within a campus. Um, that's a way to approach it. So I think it's important for a data center operator today to have multiple products that they offer to the market. You know, even if you are chasing the hyperscale, uh, companies, it is still important to be able to have products that, um, you know, attract more wholesale, typical customers, you know, 500 KW, four megawatt type range. You know, I think, you know, given all those kind of facets of that, of the, the pursuit of these hyperscale buyers, you know, one, one thing that I think is maybe overlooked by some is that you, you still have to have a demonstrated track record of execution. Yes. You know, so That's a great point. space and a building, you know, is, those are some of the required elements. They're certainly required elements. Table stakes, can I use that term? Is that too businessy? <laughs> but, but you know, we see like, you know, some of these newer entrants into the market maybe taking a little bit of time to spin up or, or kind of execute on some smaller deals before they're getting looks from those hyperscale buyers. So I think that's, it's just important to note that that's a real factor in some of the decision making that's going on. Yeah, and, and probably never more important than it is today you know, as it relates to the operational um, execution. Yeah, well, just companies being able to actually, to your point, deliver what they say they're going to do. And there's a lot of money in the data center industry right now, and I think that is exciting, but it also maybe highlights how important that is. Well, David, it's clear that these companies are, are really – driving change in the industry both you know the things that they're demanding explicitly and in the ways that the operators are trying to meet their needs so you know i think it's again we spoke about earlier this the there's still a lot of change very dynamic yep. i know that's an overused term but the way that the companies are delivering product and pursuing these customers and the way that they're needing product is again it's evolving over time so i think it's real exciting to watch 
you know, going forward in the next three to five years, what are the next kind of changes are in the industry specifically around these? They're not going anywhere. Yep. You know, they're going to continue to have growth and 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 needs kind of probably expanding out from Northern Virginia around the country as it already has, and maybe even into smaller markets. Yeah, so, you highlight like the evolution of this, and it's hard to see a stopping point. You know, it's hard to see a, a pullback in demand, especially from some of these bigger companies. So. I think from our standpoint, we're we're we love being in it and being able to help provide clarity uh, to a, uh, what we think is a really important market today. Agreed. All right, Dave. Well, great thoughts on how these large hyperscale users are impacting the industry. Again, some we'll continue to keep a close eye on. Uh, stay tuned for the next episode.